If you will, turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of 2 Peter as we continue our study through the Word. So we come to this final chapter of this short epistle that Peter writes. You'll remember the context of the letter is that Peter knows that his life is coming to an end. His ministry is closing out. And so he takes and, and pens this short letter that is filled with emotion, compressed uh, within it, distilled uh, now to the most important truths that, that he would have for us. Peter lived an extraordinary life, the life of mm, Peter, amazing. He grew up underneath the old covenant. He grew up going to the temple and offering sacrifices. And, and then half of his life uh, under the old covenant, we see then half of his life under the new covenant that God now invited uh, the world into the kingdom of God that was accessible only through the doorway of Jesus Christ. Jesus coming to open up that doorway. And Peter learned the revelation of God's truth in that covenant coming out of the bondage of the law and into the freedom of grace. His whole life was lived in a black and white world of clean and, and unclean and, and of having other people go and represent him before God. Imagine coming and bringing your gift and having to give it to somebody else that would then go on your behalf. You stay there and, and I will bring it to, to God for you. It was a, a step back, a, a, a distance from God. But now through Christ, being able to come boldly into his presence. And now the freedom of the law of liberty that was found in, in the grace of the new covenant. And, and, and it was the apostles that were the first ones that got saved. You remember that they now became born again. They had their born again experience when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. It was on the day of Pentecost that they were baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit and the church age was born on that day. Peter delivering that, that message. And Peter went on to, to be used of God mightily, of Christ, to handle the keys of the kingdom. That invitation for everybody to come into this kingdom that now had been established through Christ, he opened the doors to the Jews. He opened the doors to the Samaritans. He opened the doors to the Gentiles as well. And then for three decades, he led that early fledgling church and, and Christianity as, as a prolific leader. And now... It was time for him to depart. And so he writes this letter. The, the essence of his heart, of, uh, of what he had learned in all of that in time, not, not only had he lived half under the old covenant and half under the new covenant, but right in the middle he had three extraordinary years where he walked with the Lord, where he ate with the Lord where he had private conversations with the Lord, where he rubbed shoulders up with the Lord. <laughs> and now his life here, his time was short. And he picks up a, a pen to write now the essence of his heart, no longer being able to shepherd us himself personally, but now to leave behind uh, that revelation of his heart inspired through the Holy Spirit. He began his letter, you'll remember, by talking about faith. Faith. It is our faith that is our connection to God. It is our faith that, that is the bridge through which all the blessings of God flow. What is faith? Faith is just believing God. God says and reveals truth, and then we say yes to God's truth. That's faith. I believe you, God. I believe that what you're saying is true. The opposite of faith is when God reveals truth, you go, no, I'm not having any part of that. 
And so we approach God either by faith, believing that God is who he says he is and believing that his word will abide forever, that God says what he means and means what he says. That's faith. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to what? It's impossible to please God. If you don't believe that God is telling you the truth, then, then what is the basis of your relationship with God? And so it is holding on to the revealed truth of God. And so by faith, that is our relationship. By grace, we've been saved, but it's through faith. Why? Faith believes that God is doing what he says that he is doing. And so he's given us the avenue of salvation, but it is by faith that we apprehend the gift of salvation. And and so we see that, that Peter's first thing is, man, it is all about your relationship with God and trusting God. Faith is trusting in God. He says to faith you add, and then he gives the, the list, moral purity and, and all of the other characteristics that, that are a manifestation of this relationship that we now have. We have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in our life, and, and these characteristics are going to be made manifest in his life. When Peter is writing this, he's writing it 30 years after the, uh, the Lord has ascended into heaven, and, and he's had 30 years now of the Holy Spirit now manifesting these characteristics in his own life, being changed and fashioned and formed uh, by the Holy Spirit into those characteristics and, and qualities. Faith. Being connected to God. Most important thing. And then he says, and the word of God. The sure word of God. How do we know it's the word of God? We have the prophetic word of God, which substantiates the claim that God is who he says he is and sets it apart from any other scriptures. And so we have got the holy scriptures and we have got our faith connected to God. He says, but that's not enough. He says, because there are going to be those who will come and, and they will hold up the, that black book with the ribbon that dangles out of it and, and they will tell you what it says and they will deceive you. They will use it now for their own personal gain. So just because a person holds up a Bible, just because somebody quotes in the scriptures to you, know that you still need to, to know the scriptures yourselves. That you need to be able to test every single thing that is taught to you by the word of God itself that you need to know. The revelation of God. There will be people who will take and they will twist the scriptures. When they twist the scriptures, they distort God. They distort the image of God. They promise that they are going to bring you into liberty and in enlightenment. He says, Peter says, but be careful. Because where they will lead you is straight into bondage, not into liberty. No, hold on to God tightly. Tightly. By faith. The word of God will keep you safe. There will be those that will try and, and pull you away from the true faith. He says, don't worry about them. He says, God will take care of them. He says, God will judge them. He says, God knows how to judge the unrighteous. And, and you remember he gave those illustrations of the flood and the unrighteousness that was on the earth that was judged, Sodom and Gomorrah, and how uh, that was judged. He says, no, God knows how to judge the unrighteous, but God also knows how to preserve the righteous as well. So don't worry about them. They will be judged, and wickedness uh, will be destroyed. As we come to this third chapter now, we see that, that Peter is going to give us one final exhortation. And that final exhortation is going to be to keep your eyes lifted up. Because he is going to return. 
I think that probably the single question that Peter was asked more than any other question is, when is Jesus going to come back? I think that, I mean, you spent time with him. Did he give you any indication at all? Can you give me off the record, you know, a little bit of something that I can, I can go on? And I, I think Peter was pumped all the time for, for when is he coming back? And, and Peter is going to exhort us and encourage us to, to keep our eyes lifted up. That in this world, there is muck and there is mire. And, and it is easy to get your eyes onto the muck and mire. When you look at the world and the culture and you look at unrighteousness and sin and, and you look at all of these things that are taking place, man, your heart can grow heavy. Where you put your eyes, your heart is going to go. And so he is going to tell us to, to look up. For that same Jesus, that, that departed, is going to return in, in the same like fashion. I, I always marvel to myself how, uh, how in the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger says, you know, I'll be back. And what I marvel at is he stole that from Jesus. <laughs> that wasn't the Terminator. That was the Lord that originally said, I'll be back. And, uh, and Peter wanted us to recognize and to know that that's where our focus should be. That we are living in between the time of his first and his second coming. And that while we are pilgrims traveling through, while we are holding on to God by faith, and while we have the, the, the sureness of the prophetic word of God, keep your eyes up, not down. Because in the end, you're going to breathe your last breath, and I'm going to breathe my last breath. And when we do, it doesn't matter how we got there. Every sorrow, every tear is going to be wiped away, and you and I are going to enter into the fullness of the brightness of his glory, inexpressible joy that is beyond what we can even begin to hope, think, or even imagine. That is the reality of what will happen. But it does matter the, the quality of our journey between now and, and the time that we do step into the, the presence of the Lord. Peter knew that he had just uh, the final stretch of his journey, and and he was going to enter in. But for us, the quality of our journey from today, right now, this breath that you're taking to the very last breath that you breathe, are you going to look down? <laughs> or are you going to look up to the glorious hope of the return of Jesus Christ and to the reality of that moment that you will stand in his presence? Let's watch as Peter now pours his heart out to us here in this final chapter of his final letter. Beloved, verse 1, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. I love the fact he begins with beloved. Beloved, beloved, beloved. You see the emotion of his heart as he feels the, the final grains in the sand of the hourglass of his life running out. And you see a man that has been sanctified by the Holy Spirit in his life, this big, burly, powerful leader, fisherman, and, and now you see at the end of his life, he is a shepherd. He has been made a fisher of men and has watched over the flock that God has called him to. He, he, he calls them, he calls us his, his beloved, my, my, my beloved, my beloved. He says, I, in this second letter I'm, I'm writing to you, as, as I did in the first, just to simply remind you, just to simply remind you. He says, I'm not going to lay down any great theological insight, no deep, deep revelation of, of new things for you. He says, no, with the final bit of time that I have, I want to I remind you now to be mindful of the, uh, of the scriptures. I want to I leave behind for you instructions that, that when you get lost, when you get confused that uh, that you can know where you are i'm just i'm just going to remind you of things that you of you that you already know and and so he leaves this letter behind as as sort of a guide to us it's an interesting long time ago they used to have these things that when you were lost and you didn't know where you were and you were confused you could 
pulled them out of the glove compartment of your car. You unfolded them. They were called a map. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing. And then, and then the, and then the interesting thing in the challenge was always a challenge. Show, is if you could fold that map back up the actual way that it was supposed to go, and then the satisfaction that you had when you successfully were able to put it back uh, into the the glove compartment. Those uh, of you that are younger have no idea the joy uh, of, of simply in doing that. It's a thing called a map. <laughs> when you get lost, when you get confused, and when you lose your bearings, you would pull it out and find out where you are and where you're going and be able to find your way again. Peter says, I, I want to just leave you a map. I want to leave you a map. The world is a treacherous place. There is an adversary that is seeking to bring confusion. It's easy to, to drift off and to lose your way. But whenever you do, pull this letter back out again. I'm just going to remind you of the most important things, just, just the, the navigational barriers to be able to, to put you back onto the right path. In both of my letters, that's all I've been, that's all I've been trying to do. He says that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. He, he says that once again, the, the scriptures. He says not just the Old Testament, but also the, the New Testament as well. The Old Testament, the holy prophets that had gone before, moved by the, the Holy Spirit to, to write down and to craft the revelation of God. And that the teachings of our Lord, that's the, the, the teachings of the apostles. The apostles' commandments weren't really the apostles' commandments. What were they? They were the reiteration of Jesus' teachings. And so they heard them firsthand, and then what did they do? They just shared what Jesus said. It wasn't, it's not what we're saying, it's what Jesus said. This is all that I, that I am saying. And, and Jesus said that I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. He says, I, I came to fulfill the Old Testament. The New Covenant is laid upon the foundation of the Old Covenant. And so they go together. They're fitted together. They're not in contrast to one another. That you have the Holy Scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, combined together to give us the revelation of the Father and of the Son and of the creation all the way to the, the glorious age when we will spend eternity with God in heaven. You have those holy scriptures. Be mindful of them. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. He says, you have the word of God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says, but there are going to be those that are going to come and, and they're going to challenge uh, the word of God. Scoffers, Peter calls them. And it really comes down to simply this. What is this black book with the ribbon that mm, dangles and out of it? There are those today that would say that this is just a, a collection of stories that were written and, and put together. It's outdated and antiquated. It is not relevant for today. And, and they will say that, uh, that anybody who believes in, in the Bible needs to have their head examined. I mean, and seriously, you believe that there is some, some benevolent God that created all of this? Let me tell you that religion is nothing more than a crutch for those who are weak of mind and of disposition. For people who can't handle the reality of the world that they live in, they live in a fictitious place where they can imagine uh, that there is some glorious power that is behind all of that. Wake up and smell the roses. That is nothing but fairy tales. I suppose that you still believe in the Easter Bunny, and do you still put your tooth under the pillow hoping for a few dollars? you believe in Santa Claus? Do you believe in the myths today? You're a sad lot if you believe in those types of things. And, and there are scoffers to this very day who will mock the word of God and your belief in God itself. Peter said 
they will come. They are scoffers. There are others who, who say that the Bible is, well, it's a, it's a book. It's got good teachings in it. There is value in it. Certainly all the stories are not true that are in it, but, but there are some good moral lessons. It's not a dangerous book. It's not going to, to hurt you, but it is just a, a collection of, uh, of good moral platitudes, and, and there are certainly those people that hold that in position to the Word of God. And then there are others that believe that it is the inspired revelation of God, that it is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to discern between bone and marrow, that, that it is authoritative and that it is without errors in its original autographs. It is God-breathed, God-revelation of himself and of his plan for salvation for mankind, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will abide forever. And there are certainly those those who believe that, and everybody who believes that says, Amen. Amen. So what is the book that you hold? You see, it is the, the ammunition for us as soldiers that are out on the battlefield. Every soldier knows that if he is cut off from this ammunition, he is dead on the battlefield. And the enemy knows that if he can take the ammunition away from you, if he can separate you from the word of God, then you are going to be dead out on the battlefield. If a Christian does not have his Bible, then what does your source of truth become? If you are cut off from the truth of God's word, where do you go for truth? Where do you discover truth? Is it in your own experiences, your, your own intelligence, your own ability to, to navigate and through? I want you to know that, that feelings are real, but they are not necessarily true. A person can feel like God is far away from them, that God doesn't care about them. That You can feel that, but that's not truth. The truth is, is that God loves you, that he never takes his eyes off of you that he's never abandoned you or forsaken you, that, uh, that he knows your rising's up and your going down, that he knows the very thoughts, the intents of your heart, that he has the very hairs on your head numbered. That's the truth uh, of God's love towards you. But how do I feel about that? That can shift and change according to circumstances. So if I only have my feelings and my experiences and my intellect... Uh, the Bible says that, that feelings, the heart, are desperately wicked among all things. If the enemy can separate you from the word of God, you will get lost in confusion in, in no time. And so, above everything else is the attack against the word of God, to try and get you separated from the word of God, to keep you from reading the word of God, to keep you from studying the word of God, to keep you from doing devotions in the word of God, to, to get a layer of dust on it and to get it separated and distanced from you. And so, Peter wants you to know that there is an orchestrated satanic attack upon you to separate you from the word of God. Don't let it happen, he says. Hold fast to those scriptures. He says that they will come, these scoffers, and, uh, and they will mock your faith in the word of God. Verse 5, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. The scoffers come and they mock a universal flood. You don't believe uh, that Noah made a boat and that the whole earth was flooded. Please tell me that you don't believe that. <laughs> and they will mock that. But while they mock, the scientists still have no explanation for why up on the top of mountains, fossils are found of animals that are sea creatures that live only on the bottom of the sea. Hmm. Can't figure that one out. <laughs> no, the flood was a universal event and it was a judgment of God. 
He says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so, when God flooded the earth, in judgment of the unrighteousness that was upon the earth, he made a promise. He made a promise that he would never again destroy the unrighteousness that was upon the earth by flood, by water. The promise that he would not destroy unrighteousness by water. He gave a sign for that. That, that sign is the, is the rainbow today. That's not what it means today. There are others who have taken that very rainbow that was a promise, this is what's amazing to me, that was a promise that God would not judge unrighteousness with water, and they turn that into a sign that means ollie ollie income free. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the exact opposite of what that symbol was a sign of. That symbol and a sign was a sign of judgment, of unrighteousness of not upholding God's law and standard on the face of the earth, and that he wouldn't judge it in the same way again. But that his standards of righteousness have changed? No, God is unchanging. And so it is ironic that the very flag that is flown to demonstrate inclusiveness, diversity, and a rejection of the righteousness of the word of God would be a sign that God gave on the unrighteous judgment upon the face of the earth. He says, never again will I destroy the earth, the unrighteous on the earth, by water. But he says, but the earth and the heavens, for that matter, they will be judged and they will be destroyed. But this time not by water, this time by fire. You see, when God created the heavens and the earth, he stepped back, Adam named all the animals, and, and God looked at it all, and he said, this is, this is good. There was no sin that had entered into his creation. It was beautiful. It was glorious. And then sin entered in and corrupted the earth. We live in a corrupted uh, world, a corrupted earth. Sin also entered into heaven. Satan rebelled, took a third of the angels, and, and corruption entered into heaven. And so God is going to purge the corruption of the heaven and the earth. And so after the great white throne of judgment, after and sinners that have been judged uh, have been dispensed with, the angels, the fallen angels, and Satan himself are, are dealt with, after all all of that is done, then God is going to take this corrupted earth and he's going to burn it up. He's going to take the corrupted heaven that was the, the scene of sin and he's going to burn it up with a fervent heat with fire. And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth that will have no corruption whatsoever. And we will dwell for eternity in the presence of God, freed from any remembrance of the corruption that had entered into God's creation. He says in verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. When is the Lord going to come back? I think that the Christians have been asking that since uh, he ascended into heaven. And here we see that Peter is addressing that issue. And he says that, that time, God is outside of time, that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. And, and Peter didn't just pull that out of thin air. That comes right out of the scriptures. Psalm 90 declares, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a, a watch in the night. And so when is the Lord going to return? I'm not a date setter. But one thing that I find very interesting is typologies and patterns that are in the scripture. We see that in the scriptures there is the pattern of six and one making seven, seven being the number of completion, eight is then the number of new beginnings, and that is the, the pattern in numerology and typology. That God worked for six days and then he rested on the seventh day, the pattern of six and then one. And then that formed the week. And then the next day is eight. That is the number of new beginnings. It starts all over again. A new week begins. And so six, one, and, and then new beginnings. It is interesting to me, worth noting, 
that from Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years. If you do the genealogies, 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to Jesus is 2,000 years. And then today we are living in a time that is 2,000 years past Jesus. And so we have a a total of 6,000 years of man governing over the earth. And then it says that when the Lord returns, that he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And, and that then makes 7,000 years. And at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, that is when there is going to be the destruction of the heaven and the earth, and then a new heaven and a new earth, a new beginning is going to start again. We're ushered into that, that new era. And so we live now at a point 6,000 years where we are right on the cusp uh, of uh, the return of the Lord. We see that typologically. We also see it prophetically as all of the pieces are, are now prophetically in motion. And so uh, here we see that, uh, that the Lord, I believe, is, is getting ready to come and to return. And I believe that return um, to be imminent. It says in verse 9 that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Where is the Lord? It's been so long. It's been 2,000 years. What's the Lord doing? Well, I'll tell you what he isn't doing. He's not up in heaven goofing off. I think he's very busy right now. And, and in fact, he says, the, the, in my father's house, there's many mansions, and I go there to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. I was driving by a, a construction site, and there was just new, all this new housing that was going up in, in the track. And, and I looked at it, and I went, man, I think that's what's going on in heaven right now. I, I think that there are these tracks of mansions, and every generation needs more mansions now, all the new believers that keep accepting, they, they get a mansion too. And I believe there's a lot of construction going on up there right now. No, he's not, he's not slack. He isn't sitting there going, you know, I said I would go back, but man, I don't know. It didn't work out so well the first time I went down there. I, you know, I think I'll just hang out here for a little while longer. It's a, no, that's, that is not what's going on up there. He hasn't returned because of compassion, because of love. Because God isn't willing that any should perish, that, that all should come to a, a saving knowledge. He is giving time for every single unbeliever that has been resisting that invitation of grace and mercy and forgiveness of sins to, to receive that gift of salvation. And his waiting is not a, an aspect of slackness. It is about being long-suffering to allow everybody that opportunity to be able to come into the kingdom of God. But when the Lord does come, it will happen suddenly. He says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned uh, uh, up. And therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, uh, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? When we die and go to heaven, we don't get to take anything with us. <laughs> and then Peter lets us know that not only can you not take anything with you, but anything you leave behind is just going to get burned up anyways. So if you can't take anything with you and everything you leave behind is just destined to be burned up, huh, how does that change your priorities? How does that, in truth, how does that in reality impact you with regards to holy conduct and, and godliness? He said, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise. Remember what faith is? Believe in God's promise. And so, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter lets us know that there is going to be destruction of the heaven. There is going to be destruction of the earth, but that's not where it ends. Then God is going to recreate the new heavens and a, and a new earth where righteousness is going to dwell. The eternal state 
where we will not be marred or hindered by a sin nature and, and everything will have been washed away and cleansed and, and there will be no unrighteousness. A perfect communion with God. And so verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Therefore, beloved, <laughs> my beloved. I love that. Be diligent. Oh, be diligent. Be diligent to be found at peace with God and peace with, with others. And we see just that, that heart of, that heart of Peter. It is a farewell, a goodbye. In which do you, do you know the experience of when you have to say goodbye to someone that you're so dear to and you're so close to and you just want to keep holding on to them. You just want to keep touching them and you just want to keep rubbing your cheek against them. That somehow if I can just keep on holding them, maybe they don't have to go. Maybe they don't have to go. Hmm. It's time for Peter's departure. And he's just hugging us and just loving us and just saying, oh, my beloved, my beloved, my beloved. These are the things you just, you have to know them. You have to know them. Don't forget, I'm writing them down for you so you can remember. Remember. Be diligent with these things. Hold on tight to your faith. Hold on tight to the scriptures. Don't let anybody come in and deceive you and separate you, either through false doctrine or discrediting the word of God. They're your life, bud. And be diligent. It means to work hard to add. It's characterized by a steady, earnest, energetic effort. Keep your relationship with God tight. Be at peace your brothers and sisters and, and consider he says that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given to him has has written to you hmm. it's interesting to me that he mentions Paul in his final breath in his final words Paul the relationship between Peter and Paul oh my goodness what a relationship that was Peter was the chief shepherd over the church, and Saul, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was his chief nemesis. Here's Peter trying to protect the flock of God, and, and here is Saul of Tarsus and, and ramming into people's houses and violently taking Christians and throwing them into prison and creating havoc and de destroying to the best of his ability the, the work of the church there in Jerusalem. And, and so Peter and, and Paul, they are, they are opponents, and he is his nemesis uh, until he suddenly becomes Paul. The great apostle that, the, that then comes and, and joins him and becomes a great ally in it. An amazing work of God and the salvation and, and the change of heart of Saul who becomes Paul. And, and now in the end, we see Peter pointing people to Paul where once they, they ran from him, now listen to him. And to the wisdom that God has given him and the and the things that, that he has written. As so, also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. He says, Paul's writing, God's given him great wisdom. Man, some of that stuff is hard to understand. <laughs> Paul's one of the most brilliant minds. He's the one that writes... Theological treatises and taking us into deep waters. And that's, that's the apostle and Paul. And Peter points us to him. He's trustworthy. His words are the words of God through Paul. And they're difficult. 
Some of his doctrines are very difficult. He says that difficulty, the complexity of the things that Paul writes, know this, that the enemy will use that as an opportunity to be able to twist right there. Where it's hard to understand, that's where the enemy comes in and twists. Be careful of that. Be careful of that. And yet, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beloved, 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 Beware lest you also fall away from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Peter just couldn't even stand the thought of false teachers coming in and, and twisting and distorting God and pulling people away from the, the truth. Please don't let that happen in your life. But grow. Grow. Keep growing. Keep growing, keep growing. He says, in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace, the experience of your intimacy with Christ. And, and in knowledge, keep studying the scriptures. Keep studying the scriptures. Keep studying the scriptures. Keep growing in knowledge. To him be the glory. Both now and forever and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. And he closes this letter. As we close our time here, I want to draw our attention for a minute back to verse 5. It was in verse 5 where Peter is warning and writing about these scoffers, these false teachers that are going to rise up. He says that they will willingly, they will willfully forget. They will willfully forget about God and the things of God. That was an interesting expression to me, willfully forget. I find myself forgetting things all the time. I find myself forgetting more and more things, but normally it's on accident. <laughs> I don't mean to. I'm not intentionally forgetting. I'm just forgetting. <laughs> and here we see that, that it says that, that they are not accidentally forgetting. They're willfully forgetting. They're purposely forgetting. And what is it that they're purposely forgetting? The truth that God has revealed to them. You see, you can't forget something that you haven't already learned or understood or known. You can only forget something that has been revealed or given to you. So there is something that they had that they now don't want in their life, and they are purposely forgetting that, and that's the revelation of truth in their life. If you go back to the book of Romans, it talks about the fact that God reveals truth to every single person on the face of the planet. That the least amount of truth that's revealed to anybody is the conscience and nature. Nature declares the glory of God. And then there is the Holy Spirit that also now convicts the world of unrighteousness as well. And so there is the revelation of truth that God is transmitting to every single person. To that atheist who says there is no God, God has been revealing himself through his conscience and through nature and, and through the Holy Spirit. And, and those truths that God has revealed to them in the privacy of their heart, in the secrecy of their mind, their life, their experience, when they lay on the bed at night and God is declaring, I am real. No matter how much you say that, that I'm not, I am real. But what do they do with those revelations of God, of himself, to to their hearts and to their lives. It says that they make a choice of volition to willfully forget it. Whenever you have truth revealed to you and you choose to set it aside, you plunge yourself right into darkness. You plunge straight into darkness. And so they willfully forget truth. And so they will suffer the consequences of doing it. Not just they, but anybody. When truth is revealed to you, you either accept it uh, or you discard it. You willfully forget it. And, and it's true for them. It's true for us. It's true for everybody. Willfully forgetting truth, that is always disastrous. And as I thought about that a little bit longer, it, it occurred to me that willfully forgetting is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing when you are willfully forgetting truth. But it is not a bad thing when you are willfully forgetting those, uh, those actions in, in your lives that others have done that, that have hurt you, transgressions. 
And I thought, isn't that exactly what God does? Doesn't God willfully <laughs> forget your sin? As far as the east is from the west, he willfully, he purposely, as a choice, as an act of volition, chooses not to remember. It's not that he accidentally forgets. He doesn't look at you and say, you know, there's some sins. I can't remember what they are. Can you remind me of the sins that, uh, that you committed? <laughs> he doesn't accidentally forget your sins. He purposefully and willfully forgets our sin. And I thought to myself, that's a definition of forgiveness, is it not? To willfully forget transgressions. And then I thought, God wants us to also willfully forget. Not truth. That's destructive in our life. But to willfully forget every transgression that anybody has ever committed against us. To release every single bit of bitterness that is in our heart to make a volitional will to forget. To not remember it, to turn it over to God. God will judge it and I am going to move forwards and I am going to release that burden that is in my heart so that I am free to be able to love. You see, whatever part of your heart has bitterness and unforgiveness in it renders that part of your heart unable to love. It is locked down in that. The more bitterness that is in your heart, the less room there is in your heart to be able to, to love those that are around you. When Jesus was asked what's the most important thing that there is in your life, he said, love God with all your heart. Not nah, with whatever portion isn't tied up with unforgiveness and bitterness. Love him with that part and just hold on to the bitterness and, and work that out later. You see, you can't love God with all your heart if you're harboring resentment, unforgiveness, and bitterness with brothers and sisters, with family members, with parents, with children, with neighbors, with co-workers, with, with anybody that has hurt you, harmed you, betrayed you, lied about you, gossiped about you, that, and that has broken your trust, that has broken your heart. You can't love God with that part of your heart that is still holding on to those things. And what happens? The quality of your life diminishes. God doesn't want you to be locked down with a heart that is only partially operating. He says you have to willfully forget. Just like I will willfully forget every transgression that you have ever committed against me, so also as that is a basis, you willfully forget every transgression that has ever been committed. And then, with the wholeness of your heart, love me and love others. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I pray that if there is any willful forgetfulness that needs to take place here today, that before we stand up and depart, Lord, that we wouldn't take and willfully forget the truth that you are sharing with us but that we would willfully forget those hurts, Lord, that we may have been holding on to. God, you promised that your word will set us free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. And Lord, may, may there be a, a freedom today that comes as we surrender what needs to be surrendered unto you. Lord, may we hold on to our faith tightly. May we hold fast to the scriptures. Lord, may we keep our eyes tilted upwards for your imminent return. And God, may we praise you with all of our heart for the great things that you have done. We love you, God. We thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.